Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Academia Sinica lecture today. Today our speaker is Professor Quentin Skinner from the University of London. He's a fellow of the British Academy and the Boston Prize Laureate 2006. First, the president of Academia Sinica, Dr. Chi Hui Wong, is going to deliver the welcome remarks. Now let's welcome President Wong. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce uh, uh, this year's Academia Sinica Lecture, uh, Professor Quentin Skinner. <coughs> professor Skinner is currently uh, Barbara Bauman Professor of the Humanities at the Queen Mary University of London. He is one of the most eminent and influential scholars of political thought of our time. In the late 60s and early 70s, uh, Professor Skinner elaborated a theoretical and philosophical point of view centered on the nature of political discourse and the historian's task of uh, interpreting text. The methodological tools Professor Skinner developed in the second half of the 70s produced a range of historical research uh, focusing on the genesis of the modern ideas of liberty and state. In 2006, uh, Professor Skinner was recognized by the prestigious Boston Prize for his formulation of a distinctive methodology, uh, methodology for the study of the history of ideas, for major contribution to the history of political thought, and his acute reflections on the nature of uh, liberty. Professor Skinner was previously the Regius Professor of Modern History at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he is the author or co-author of more than 200 books. Uh, his works have been very widely translated and are available in 24 languages. His fundamental contribution in this area is the monumental uh, two-volume uh, study entitled The Foundations of Modern Political Thought, uh, which was published in uh, 1978 has become a classic in the field of the history of modern political thought. <coughs> and this book was named in 1996 uh, as one of the 100 most influential books published since the Second World War. Professor Skinner's scholarship has been recognized uh, with many, uh, many awards, including, for example, the Wilson History Prize, the Bowson Prize, and the Birofira Science Award. He has been the recipient of um, many honorary degrees from 12 uh, leading universities, including, for example, Chicago, uh, Harvard, and Oxford. He is a fellow of the British Academy, the Royal Historical Society, and the Academia Europea a foreign member of the National Academies of Austria, Ireland, and Italy, and a foreign honorary member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And during his stay in Taiwan, Professor Skinner will present the result of his uh, lifelong uh, research in three lectures. The topic of his lecture today is uh, Truth and the Historian. His second lecture, entitled a, method, uh, a genealogy of liberty will be given here on Wednesday, and his third lecture entitled A Genealogy of the State will take place at the National uh, Taiwan University on Thursday. I want to once again uh, express a special gratitude to Professor Skinner for accepting our invitation to be the Academia uh, Sinica Lecture. Uh, I believe that uh, uh, today, when science and technology dominate our thinking, uh, the study of philosophy and history is even more essential and critical. So ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, welcome Professor Skinner. Before I say anything else, uh, may I 
offer a word of very warm thanks to everyone here for allowing me to come here to this very great institution and talk to you in my own language. This is an extraordinary privilege and it is one that we Anglophones, above all, must not take for granted. So thank you very much. And thank you all for coming. And may I also say how delighted I am to be here in Taiwan, which I'm visiting for the first time, and how extremely proud I am to have been invited to deliver the Academia Sinica Lectures for 2013. This is a very great honor. And I want to begin by expressing my warmest thanks to the President and to everyone involved at the Academy for organizing these lectures. Thank you all very much. It's a great joy to be here. Well, I shall be delivering, uh, as has been said, three lectures this week. And today, in the first of them, I want to do nothing less than to try to lay out before you my understanding of the nature of the historian's task. The two other lectures will then be devoted to themes that have not only preoccupied me in my recent work, but are also dominant in modern political theory in the West. That's to say the concept of freedom and the concept of the state and the question of the relationship between the freedom of subjects or citizens and the power of the state. So notice that this means I shall be talking about Western political assumptions and values, and more especially, I shall be drawing on the Anglophone tradition of discourse. So you could think of me as talking about my own tribe, um, and a good spirit in which you might like to listen to these lectures is as anthropologists. So here is someone coming from a different tribe and telling you how we think about things. And then you can think about that. And you might think, well, thank God we're not members of that tribe. Or you might think, that's quite interesting. But that's going to be for you to say. I'm going to try and talk about how this world of thinking about contemporary political theory and its history strike me. Now, as you will have seen if you've looked at the program for this week, um, when I examine the concept of freedom and the concept of the state, the approach that I'm adopting is what I've called a genealogical approach. So I'd like to begin this first lecture, which is entirely about historical method. It's a philosophical lecture. I'd like to begin by saying something about genealogy as a way of doing history, the history of philosophy in particular. As I'm sure you know, within the Western tradition of philosophy, if you talk about genealogy, everyone will think about the great name of Nietzsche, or more recently, a scarcely less great name, of Foucault. So that being so, I need to make it clear that my view of genealogy is not the same uh, as Nietzsche's. I'm not sure if it's the same as Foucault's because I can't understand what his view is. But I'm confident that in the case of Nietzsche, his principal claim about genealogy is connected with his core doctrine of the will to power. Nietzsche wants to say that if we trace the roots of our present evaluations, we shall generally come upon the opposite of what we currently believe. So the Nietzschean point of the purpose of genealogy is to confront specifically ideas that deny their ancestry. Now, my employment of the concept is a broader one. I'm concerned with all beliefs, not just beliefs that deny their ancestry. But at the same time, the way I use the notion of genealogy is um, a simpler one. I simply find it very helpful um, in mapping the changing applications of central evaluative terms, such as freedom, to think of ways of thinking about these terms as being in a descending family tree. And if you come to my next lecture on Wednesday, which will be entirely a PowerPoint presentation, 
you will see me try to do genealogy in that way, as, it, as seeing a descent of concepts uh, as they come apart. Now, the reason why I adopt that approach and why I think it's valuable is that it enables you to work out whether the, the terms that express these key concepts have had an unchanging meaning or whether their applications have been contested over time. Now, another great Nietzschean insight is this, that if you find a concept which has a history, you have found a concept which cannot have a definition. And certainly in the West, the concept of freedom has been the most contested concept, I think, in politics over a very long period. So you're forced in the direction of a genealogy because the idea of getting a, a, a neutral analysis of the concept of freedom on which we might in principle all agree, that is a major illusion. And it's the illusion that we must give up and which genealogy helps us to give up. Now, if that is so, then another value of adopting that approach is that it helps us, I hope, to write and think about the concepts that organize our moral and political thinking in a way that avoids a rather prevalent danger. That's to say, to look for neutral definitions when we should be examining the history of contestations. All the concepts that we now use, you should think of as frozen battles. Someone won that battle, and that's the way we now understand the concept. But it could have come out very differently. And the role of the historian in relation to philosophy, and I make no real distinction between the historian and the philosopher here, is to do that uncovering process that enables you to see what the contestations have been. Why? Because you might decide that your current reading of the concept is not the most fruitful one. So history could actually be an instructor. In the history of philosophy, the, the history is always the history of the present. Now, I'm already talking about historical method and the work of the historian because that's a kind of introduction to what I want to talk about uh, in the rest of this week. But today, I want to approach the question of method in the most direct fashion that I can think of, which is by asking about the core question that confronts any student of the human sciences, which is the question of the truth. So I'm going to do nothing less now than lay before you my kind of credo as an historian. Now, insofar as I am an historian, uh, I'm a particular kind of historian, that's to say what would nowadays be called an intellectual historian, and more specifically, an historian of philosophy. Um, if you ask what distinguishes that kind of historian from an economic historian or a, or, or a political historian, I would say that it is a preoccupation with texts. And here I mean texts, not just in the sense in which a newspaper is a text or a public speech, such that I'm now giving, is a text, uh, but also cultural historians are interested in texts in a more extended way, which uh, French philosophy, I suppose, has most of all bequeathed to us, the sense in which a building uh, or uh, a social action or a painting uh, might equally well be read as a text. Think of it as a text. Think about its meanings. Think about its purposes. Now, if you take the notion of text in that very general sense, that's my subject this afternoon. And what I want to do is to single out two general claims that are often made by intellectual historians about texts in this very extended sense that I'm talking about. So the two things I'm going to talk about, and here's the first. It's widely assumed that the aim of the intellectual historian should be to treat the texts that he or she studies 
essentially as affirmations of belief. Think of them as statements of belief. Now, that is the position that philosophers uh, uh, commonly ask historians to take up. Mark Bevere, for example, I quote his book, The Logic of the History of Ideas, makes the very strong claim, I quote, that when people make, when people make an utterance, they express a belief. And it is these beliefs that constitute the object of research for the historian of thought. Notice that's a very strong term. Utterances are expressions of belief. Now, that is a view which historians have usually been more than happy to adopt. And I, I take a very distinguished example, Keith Thomas writing in his masterly work, Religion and the Decline of Magic, the aim of the cultural historian, I'm quoting him, is to study past systems of belief. And as Thomas goes on, when historians investigate such systems of belief, they can hardly fail to reflect that few of the beliefs under investigation enjoy much recognition today. But that, I'm still quoting, that, he says, is, of course, the challenge for the historian. Because while many beliefs entertained by our forebears in the past may strike us as obviously false or even groundless, the fact remains, I quote Thomas again, that many intelligent persons held these beliefs to be true and the historian's task is to explain why that was so. Now, that idea has been very widely taken up in Western history in, in the study of cultural history in the Western tradition in the past 50 years or so. And let me just give two examples. They will be very familiar examples to you, but if they're not, then you'll immediately see the point, um, uh, which have been the object of a tremendous amount of, of attention by cultural historians uh, in recent times. First, there has been a lot of interest amongst historians of science in past cosmological beliefs, a trend which was perhaps given its strongest impetus by Thomas Kuhn in his classic book on the Copernican Revolution, the insights of which he generalized into one of the great texts in the history of philosophy of our time uh, in the Western tradition, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. Kuhn, you may know, examined, amongst other things, the great moment in the history of Western science when the representative of the Catholic Church Cardinal Bellarmine met Galileo in order to debate with Galileo Copernicus's hypothesis that the Earth orbits the Sun, and in which Bellarmine thought it obvious that the, the Sun goes round the Earth. Galileo thought it was obvious that the Earth goes round the Sun. So one of them must be wrong. <laughs> So there's one question about, about truth um, uh, uh, that has very much preoccupied uh, historians. And another question uh, uh, that has preoccupied cultural historians in the West has been uh, in early modern Western Europe, the, and in early modern America as well, the extraordinarily strong prevalence of witchcraft beliefs. Um, and there's an enormous literature on that topic, and it's already given rise to several masterpieces. I think one I've already mentioned, Keith Thomas's book, Religion and the Decline of Magic, but more recently, Stuart Clarke's remarkable book called Thinking with Demons, but most perhaps famous of all uh, in Europe, um, uh, although not translated into the English language until the 1970s, was the pioneering work on witchcraft beliefs and practices by the great French historian, the greatest French historian of the age, Emmanuel Le Roi La Durie, who produced a book called The Peasants of Languedoc, two-volume book, in which he investigated their systems of belief. La Durie focused on the now completely alien belief, which was, however, widespread in early modern Europe, that some people are capable of forming covenants, forming leagues uh, with the evil spirits, with evil, with devilish spirits, and that this grants those people power to do their neighbors harm. 
So these people are witches. Now, so there are, uh, are two examples of the sort of thing I want to talk to you about this afternoon. Cardinal Bellarmine may have been wrong to suppose that the sun orbits the earth, but that is what he believed. He believed that to be true. He may not have been right, but that was what he believed. The demonologists were likewise, perhaps, I think we would say definitely, in error in supposing that it is possible to enter into a pact with the devil, but that is what they believed. They believed that that was possible. Now, the, so the task of the cultural historian is to identify and to explain such beliefs. The second and closely connected claim I want to examine is that when, as historians, we encounter such alien beliefs, Cardinal Bellarmine's belief that the sun orbits the earth, or the, the early modern belief that you can form a pact with the devil, um, what you must begin by doing is by concentrating on the strongly alien character of these beliefs. And that's emphatically, for example, Ladiori's commitment in his book on um, the peasants of Languedoc. He prefaces his discussion of peasant views about satanic possession by emphasizing, I quote, that these beliefs were not only obviously false, but amounted to little more than a product of mass delirium. And Norman Cohn, in his famous book, Europe's Inner Demons, speaks in almost identical terms. I quote, if we are to explain such beliefs, we, begin, we need to begin by recognizing not merely that they were false, but that they took the form of nothing more than a collective fantasy. Now, I'm not this afternoon interested in the actual explanations that these historians go on to give of why people held witchcraft beliefs. Though, I mean, it's worth emphasizing that La Durie had two explanatory claims he wanted to make um, about what caused people to entertain these fantasies. One was to do with the religious reformation of early modern Europe and the loss of traditional ties to a priesthood, the sense of, of being at loose in a, a mysterious world in which you lacked spiritual guidance. And he wanted to say it was a very short step from that sense of a loss of spiritual guidance to an acceptance of the possibility that you could seek that guidance and that power in satanic um, practices. But um, La Durie's other, and indeed his principal hypothesis, is that most people felt frustrated at the collapse of efforts to promote social change that were associated with the European Reformation. And so what he thinks of um, in talking about the prevalence of witchcraft beliefs was that they were a form of escape. This was an escape from circumstances which you had hoped would improve, which had not improved. So um, it's, it's a, a, an expression of some kind of deep frustration that leads you into this fantasy. Well, those are interesting claims, obviously, but what uh, I'm concerned with this afternoon is with the underlying philosophy of La Durie's history. As you can now see, what he thinks you must do if you're a cultural historian investigating such systems of belief is two things. Focus on whether the beliefs are true or false, and if they are false, I mean, it's false, uh, to believe that you can make a pact with the devil, he wants to say. That's completely false. So then the explanatory question is this. What pressures, what causal pressures can we point to? Psychological pressures, economic pressures, um, social pressures. What pressures can we point to that would have prompted you to fall into these fantasies? So ask if it's true, if it's false, ask what the causal pressures were that stopped you seeing the truth. So there's the approach. 
All right, that was all exegesis, I, I, and that was all trying to lay before you what you need to know in order for me to offer commentary. So what I want now to do is to comment on these two claims that I have isolated. So let's go back to the first, which you remember was the view that these texts or forms of action, as they are uh, in the case I've talked about, um, that we study uh, in intellectual history, um, that these texts are best thought of as statements, as affirmations of belief. Okay, so there was the first thought. These are affirmations of belief. Okay. Do you really think that all the utterances that you might study in historical texts can be classed as affirmations of belief? Is, is, that, pl is that plausible? I mean, consider a, a literary work. Do you really want to say that these texts are statements of belief? I mean, let me give you... Uh, 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 all my examples today are from the Western tradition, obviously. Why, why is that? Because I've been lecturing in public for many years and I've decided that it's best to lecture about what you know about. So this is what I know about. So that's why these are my examples. Let me give you a very famous example from English literature. Actually, it may be the most famous moment in the whole of English literature. The passage in William Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice, when the young um, attorney, it's actually Portia in disguise, calls upon Shylock to show mercy to the merchant Antonio, who has promised him a pound of flesh if he cannot pay his debt. And he cannot pay his debt, so Portia says in court this famous speech about mercy and how mercy is a greater value than justice. And we should not care about justice if we can offer mercy. That's a great scene, uh, and we were all brought up to know it by heart. But the question is, is it sensible to suppose that this is an affirmation by Shakespeare of one of his beliefs? Did Shakespeare believe that mercy was better than justice? Well, you may be surprised to learn that there's a large literature on that subject and that the general view is, yes, uh, obviously Shakespeare believed that mercy was better than justice. Why otherwise would he have written this great poem about it? Um, and this tells us about Shakespeare's humanism. And of course, because he is our national poet, we want him to be a nice person. Um, we have absolutely no reason to believe that Shakespeare thought mercy was better than justice. He was writing a play, uh, and this is a speech put in the mouth of a fictional character. It has nothing to do with his beliefs. We don't know what he believed. And it's ridiculous to suppose that you can infer beliefs from statements put into the mouth of fictional characters in literature. Well, you might object, you might say, well, all right, uh, we can't assume that literary texts are statements of belief. Uh, I mean, I certainly think we can't. But you might say, well, that's a special case. When, uh, what about philosophical treatises? What about a philosophical treatise? Surely we would want to say that if you write a work of philosophy, you are affirming your beliefs, just as if you write a work of science, you're affirming your beliefs. Well, I mean, what else would you be doing? Well, I do not think that that is a good answer, although I can see that to doubt that is, is a much more radical doubt, and so I'm going to have to say something much more about that. I'll give you another example from the Western tradition that will enable me to show you why I, I, just, I still don't think that this stuff about texts and the affirmation of beliefs, I still don't think it's a good way to go. So, and the example I'll give you is taken from uh, perhaps the most famous work of political philosophy of the European tradition, uh, the little book that Machiavelli wrote called The Prince. If you know that book, you will know that, you don't have to know it, because I'm about to tell you what it says. In chapter 18 of uh, Machiavelli's book, The Prince, 
he makes what is the most famous observation in that text, that a political leader who hopes to attain glory for himself and welfare for his people must learn to imitate the lion and the fox. So there's the famous Machiavelli statement. How would you interpret that remark? Well, the answer usually given is that Machiavelli is claiming, uh, that's to say he's affirming the belief, that success in politics depends on recognizing the unavoidability of fraud and also the unavoidability of force. If you don't like the idea of sometimes having to behave fraudulently, don't go into politics. Likewise, if you are averse to violence, don't go into politics. That's what he's saying. That's his belief. And the fox is the symbol of deceit. And the lion is the symbol of strength. So in politics, you need to be a lion and a fox. That's his belief. Now, in this case, uh, of course, I don't wish to deny that that is his belief. But suppose you're an intellectual historian and you're trying to understand this famous passage. It, it would be, it seems to me, extraordinary to stop at that point and say, well, that, that explains the passage. That's what he believes. Uh, that's how we unpack the metaphor. That's what he's telling us. After all, this famous remark was not launched into a cultural void. It was part of an extensive literature of advice books to political leaders at the time, um, in which everybody agreed that glory was the goal of political leaders and welfare for their people, their further goal, and that the means to uh, attain these goals, unless you were defeated by ill fortune, was to cultivate the quality of virtue. And by the use of this term in the Renaissance tradition, uh, they were denoting not merely the classical virtues, the moral virtues, as we would say, but also uh, 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 the quality of virtue that came from the, 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 the ancient tradition in Europe, um, the Roman tradition, in which uh, the, the, the word virtus, the word for vi virtue, is also the word for a man. Vir, in Latin, is the word for a man, the source of the English word virile. A, a real man is, is a vir. So virtus is the quality of manliness. So a defining characteristic in this tradition of political leadership would be the possession of manly qualities, whatever they might be. Now notice what Machiavelli is saying is, well, if you want success in, in politics, maybe you need manly qualities, but you also need beastly qualities. You want the man, but you also want the beast. You, manly qualities are not enough. You also have to have beastly qualities. So the question is, which beasts? And he says, well, the lion and the fox, those are the two beasts. Th those are the qualities you need. So what's he doing in this passage? He's, he's opposing an undoubted maxim of political morality of his age, namely that manliness is the key to political success. So he's questioning the adequacy of prevailing views of virtue, and he's redefining what it means to speak of political virtue as the key attribute of political leaders. Furthermore, and this is a more learned point, Machiavelli is launching that critique into a culture in which undoubtedly the most widely respected work of moral philosophy, the most widely taught, it was how you learnt Latin. Still, when I was a boy, this is how you learnt Latin, was to read the text by Cicero called the De Ficiis, concerning moral duties. Now, if you read Cicero's De Ficiis, you find in book one that he says this. I'm quoting, obviously I'm translating. There are two ways in which injustice can be done, either by force or by fraud. But both these methods are bestial and unworthy of mankind. Force because it belongs to the lion and fraud to the cunning fox. So, it turns out that Machiavelli in the passage I'm citing, is also quoting Cicero, but he's at the same time reminding his readers of a work which they would all have known about, and he is at the same time ridiculing it. So my point about the famous passage is that 
Machiavelli is not merely stating his belief that force and fraud are necessary for political success. A great deal more is going on. And if you are an historian interested in understanding this work, you need to know that that's his belief, but in the passage in which he states that belief, he at the same time quotes Cicero, reminds his readers of that text, questions one of its cardinal doctrines, satirizes and repudiates it, questions the underlying view of manliness, redefines the relevant notion of virtue, all in one paragraph. But all of that is what's going on. And to interpret the text is to see all of that. So if you say that you've identified the belief, I don't in this case doubt that you have, I just doubt if you've started to perform the work of the historian. For me, what's crucial about the example I've given you, and I'm working with examples so that the generalizations, I hope, will look more intuitively convincing, is that we haven't just got a richer interpretation of a famous passage now, although I hope we have, but notice we are not treating this passage primarily as an expression of belief. What we're seeing in it is that it's an intervention in a pre-existing political argument and that it's a questioning of the terms of that argument and an attempt to redefine a debate. This is something that I'm going to be talking about a lot later this week, that the right way to think about the great works of philosophy is to assume, a priori, that they are interventions in some pre-existing argument and to try to identify what the intervention constituted by the text is. I think that that's a general truth about texts, and I've no reason to suppose that they would only be Western texts that that be, would apply to. So I'm interested in a hermeneutics which cent makes central not the notion of meaning, but the notion of action. So to generalize my point, I think that the appropriate vocabulary for textual interpretation is not the vocabulary of beliefs, but the vocabulary of actions. The question is, what is the text doing? What's going on in the text? What are its underlying purposes? What is the writer up to, as you might even say in an English idiom? That is the heart of my hermeneutics. That's what I really want to say this afternoon, is interpretation is about recovering what texts are doing. Of course you have to understand what they mean. But in Western hermeneutics in recent times, the notion of meaning has, I think, rightly fallen into disrepute as a way of thinking about interpretation, because meanings vary, and you can always uh, see ambiguities in meanings. And a whole tradition stemming from post-structuralist French philosophy, and especially from Derrida, has insisted that so the traditional project of hermeneutics is a mistake. But what I'm so struck by is how traditional Derrida's objection to hermeneutics is. His is an objection to attempts to recover meaning. I'm not talking about meaning. My hermeneutics is immune to those criticisms because it wants you not to focus on meaning at all, but on doing. Not on meaning, but on action. May I round off this first half of my remarks by drawing out two implications of what I've been saying, which I think are important for the cultural disciplines. I I've got to be careful in starting to talk about what I'm saying being important. Bertrand Russell, one of my great heroes, once said that when an academic starts to tell you that their work is important, it's a sure sign of an impending nervous breakdown. <laughs> but let me nevertheless try to say two things that seem to me important first. If there is always necessarily some intervention that, that, that any text is making in its culture, then there's no categorical distinction to be drawn between philosophy and ideology. It will always be worth asking, even of the most abstract texts, most abstract written texts, not, I imagine, mathematical texts, but of any written text, it will be worth asking 
what is this text doing? What is the intervention that it makes? And it will always be the case that that is going to direct you to something in the broadest sense of the word political, something in the culture that's driving this intervention. My other observation is that if we treat the texts that we study essentially as interventions, then there is something that I want to say which is sort of rather fashionable in Western discourse about interpretation at the moment, which is the decentering Foucault's notion of which I very much appreciate uh, of decentering the figure of the author. Because the, the, the author of a text who's announcing his or her beliefs becomes an agent intervening in an ongoing process and forming him or herself part of that process. So that interpretation becomes more the project, this was Foucault's project, I think, uh, and why genealogy mattered to him, of trying to understand a culture arguing with itself. Forget about individual authors, think about them as contributions to an ongoing cultural argument. And I think that's a very salutary idea. Well, there's my first thought. Um, uh, think about the vocabulary of action rather than the vocabulary of meaning in talking about texts. But I must not press that too hard because it's obviously the case that many of the texts that we would study as intellectual historians, historians of philosophy, do take the form of affirmations of belief. I'm not here to deny that, obviously. When Cardinal Bellarmine, in his dispute with Galileo, talked about whether the sun orbits, orbits the earth or whether the earth orbits the sun, he insisted that the claim that the sun orbits the earth is true. That's the truth. The sun orbits the earth. And that was what he believed. And he believed that to be the truth. So, likewise, the demonologist studied by La Durie, believe that it is true that people can be in league with the devil. That's their belief, that's what they think to be true. So we as historians of belief systems do have to ask about truth. And that's what I now want to talk about. Now, we saw what the standard answer to this question is in, uh, amongst historians whom I've talked about. If you encounter such a deeply alien belief as, for example, the pre-Galilean cosmological belief that it's the sun that orbits the earth, you must begin by concentrating on the fact that that belief is false. That is a false belief. And then you must ask, why couldn't this person see the truth? And that's, of course, what La Durie does. And he says, well, because these various reasons he gave that I told you about, they, they were prevented, there were, there were pressures in their society that were preventing them from seeing the truth. So that's the key claim. What should we think of that claim? I mean, that's a, a really general claim about historical method focus on their falsity, ask what causal pressures stop them seeing the truth. What do you think about that? Well, I'll tell you what I think about that, which is that I think that's, that's the worst possible approach that you could possibly adopt to doing good history. And that's why it's been important to me that this is the approach of really major Western historians of the present generation. It's really bad, I stand here to say, don't do that. <laughs> Why? And here's the most important thing I want to try and say this afternoon. Because it assumes, notice, it assumes that when an historian encounters in the past a belief, Cardinal Bella means belief that Galileo was wrong. Now, the historian thinks Galileo was right. So when the historian encounters a belief that he or she judges to be false, the explanatory task is taken to be that of explaining a lapse from reasoning. But that 
is to equate the holding of a rational belief, a belief you ought to hold, with the holding of a belief that the historian judges to be true. And notice what that has excluded. It's excluded something of the first importance for the historian, which is that even in the case of beliefs that now strike us as manifestly false, pre-Galilean uh, celestial mechanics, for example, it may, in a certain period in the past, have been rational to hold that belief to be true. And the question for the historian, then, is whether it was rational to hold true the belief that we hold false. Uh, you've got to hold that gap open, it seems to me, if you're going to write history. So what I'm pleading for here is a very strong distinction between the concept of truth and the concept of rationality. If you encounter a belief, uh, an everyday belief, uh, uh, which seems to you completely irrational, it's, it's completely irrational that someone should hold this belief, and you're able to identify that that's so, then, of course, you are looking for an explanation for a lapse of reasoning. And that is going to be a very strongly causal form of explanation because it's going to take the form of looking for causal pressures that have interrupted some no normal process of reasoning. You need to inquire into the sorts of conditions that could have prevented the agent from seeing the truth or caused the agent to defy uh, the evidence and so on. But here's the point. It is surely perfectly possible to follow the best available canons of argument in one's society in relation to the formation and the testing of beliefs and nevertheless arrive at a belief which is false. I mean, I'm sure we have all done that. So to equate the holding of a belief that seems to us false with a lapse from rationality is to foreclose on the type of explanation you want. There's the crucial point. If there really has been a lapse from rationality, you want strongly causal explanation. If the belief is false but is rationally held, then that's another matter. And notice how La Durie, in the example I gave, has run those together. He thinks there's n there isn't the space that I've tried to say there is. So he not only thinks that the witchcraft beliefs he studied are false, he assumes that, that because they're false, they can't have been rationally held. So his explanation has to be about how they came to lapse from rationality. So he's left himself no space to consider the following alternative. Did these people also hold various other beliefs, which it may have been rational for them to hold, such that the belief in demonological possession was a rational belief for them to have held. Is that possible? Now, that's, he, he never thinks about that because of the, the way he's gone to work on the logic of explanation. But if you open up the gap between truth and rationality, that's the question you have to ask. And I think you would find that in the example I've given, it was rational for them to hold this belief to be true. Although we would think it obviously false. Why was it rational? Well, there are many reasons, but consider only the most obvious. In the period that I'm talking about, the, the Bible in Christian Europe was widely believed to be the word of God. And it took a lot of philosophical work in the 17th century by Hobbes and Spinoza and later writers to dismember the notion that the Bible is the word of God. And they did it by the kind of hermeneutics that I've been talking about this afternoon, asking, well, you know, who wrote this? What was the intervention? This is just a piece of Bronze Age literature. This is not the word of God. But this was a vital belief in the earlier period that the Bible is the word of God. Now, if you read the Old Testament of the Christian Bible, it says not only that there are witches, that they can engage in demonic possession, but that these people must be persecuted, they must not be allowed to live. Of course, that was very important in the European witch trials and later in the American witch trials in the 17th century. You looked at the Bible, it said, of course there are witches, of course they can do this. Now, what would have been required then for you to say, to come into court, 
and say, look, th th this is ridiculous. There's no such thing as witches. There can't be demonic possession. It would have required you to say that God was telling a lie. But uh, would you ever say that? Well, for one thing, you'd be killed if you said that. So would you ever believe that? If you disbelieved that, you disbelieved the foundation of the Christian faith. So it was very unlikely that you would believe that, and if you believed it, you certainly wouldn't say it. So there's a completely alternative way of starting to think about witchcraft beliefs. That these people are living in a society in which, of course, it's, they think it's true that there are witches. I mean, we don't, but of course they do. And they have very good reasons for thinking that they are witches. We don't think those are good reasons. But we're trying to understand the past. And they did think they were good reasons, and they were good reasons for them. That's what I've tried to say. They were good reasons for them. Now, that's what La Durie has excluded. Uh, to start off, I mean, he excludes the mental world of these people, because he thinks he lives in, in, in the mental world which can distinguish truth from fantasy and show that if it's not truth, it must be fantasy. So he has bypassed a whole range of questions which proper cultural history would have to go into, which is, how alien were these people? Anthropologists, of course, are far more used to thinking like this. Um, but historians should be, in this way, cultural anthropologists. Try to vindicate the inherent rationality of whatever beliefs you study. That has to be the watchword. Now, I, I've said that's the watchword, but I, it, it is, I think, true that you could go too far there. And I, I myself think that in postmodern culture, um, we have gone, some historians, I think, have gone too far because they've espoused a particular view of truth, a theory of truth, namely, that what truth is, is coherence of belief. So that if I can show that my beliefs fit together into a pattern and that they cohere, that is sufficient to show that they're true. That's what it is to show that they're true. And, I mean, historians have tended in recent times, for example, Stuart Clarke in his great book, Thinking with Demons, says if we can vindicate the internal coherence of a system of beliefs, that is enough to show uh, that, that it was rational to hold those beliefs. Now, I don't agree with that at all. I, I mean, it seems to me we're asking uh, uh, the philosophical question, what is the relationship um, of consistency to rationality? Now, I, I think anyone would say that an interest in the consistency of your beliefs is a necessary condition of those beliefs being rationally held. If you have no interest in whether your beliefs are consistent, then you will uh, find that you hold beliefs which cancel each other. But if you hold the belief that P and also that not P, you can't hold both of those beliefs rationally. One of them must be false. I mean, you know that a priori. So, of course, consistency is a necessary condition of rationality. The question is, is it sufficient? Uh, I think it can't be. It can't be sufficient. Because surely it's also a necessary condition of any belief you hold being rationally held that it should be held in the light of some view about how it is proper to form beliefs. What gives me good grounds for holding them? Uh, how can they be justified? Is there evidence? Is there countervailing evidence? This is how any scientist would want to talk about whether it's rational to uphold a particular explanatory hypothesis. And here we should follow the scientists, absolutely. That, that idea of what it is to hold a rational belief, we must not give up on. It's something to do with uh, consistency, of course, but it's also something to do with evidence and the criteria for forming beliefs. Now that is um, obvious, I think, to our scientific colleagues, but in a, a postmodern cultural context, that is quite old-fashioned, what I've just said. It's true, but it's old-fashioned. Um, that was a joke. <laughs> uh, why is it old-fashioned? Well, we're told now um, that 
if you talk as I've just talked, what you're doing is imposing anachronistic and condescending views about our superior rationality upon the past. But that is a misunderstanding. I'm not doing that at all. I'm not saying that these people should be able to show that their beliefs are rational according to my canons of rationality, still less the canons of rationality, whatever that might mean. I don't know what that would mean. What I am saying is you can always ask of a belief that you encounter in another society than ours, you can always ask whether it's a rational belief for that person to have held in that society. Did it, that's to say, follow or did it violate or did it defy the canons of belief formation in that society? And those you must identify. So, did they believe that the Bible was the word of God? If they stopped believing that, well then, it perhaps wasn't so rational to believe in witches. As long as they believed that, it was. So, you see how that would fit together and shift. That's the historian's task, to identify their views about what is an all right view to hold, an all right belief to hold. Now, uh, so uh, that was a, uh, b by the side of what I really want to say, which is the course, what I really want to say is that I'm fully committed to the view that the cultural historian's task is trying to do as much as possible to vindicate the internal rationality of alien mental worlds. You can't say that they are necessarily rational. That would be a reckless stupidity. Uh, but you must try to make them rational, as rational as possible. That's what I'm suggesting. Uh, and the crucial point was the one that Thomas Kuhn put a long time ago in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, one of the great philosophical works of the age, I think, when he said of the famous debate between Cardinal Bellarmine and Galileo, there is no moment when you can definitely say that Bellarmine's view is irrational. You can certainly say it's false. I mean, we all think it's false. But can you say it's irrational? And he thought, no. There's no point at which you could definitely say Galileo is the rational credent and Bellarmine is not. That's what you can't say. There's no point at which it's not rational. It's not true what he's saying, we would say. But it's rational to believe it to be true because of his other beliefs. So, it was perfectly rational for him to hold true a belief that we hold false. That's what you've got to see. It's very obvious, but that's what you've got to see. It can't be so obvious because all of these famous historians have failed to get it. So what I'm saying is, if you're an historian, don't even ask about the truth or falsity of beliefs in the past. Don't, don't go there, as my students say. Just ask whether it was rational for that belief to be held to be true. That's what you should ask yourself. And try and find out the answer to that question by trying to find out the canons of, of um, argument uh, and proof that were prevailing in that society. Well, that's my basic claim. And in a way, I end there, um, but I don't quite end there, because I've still got five minutes, I think, to speak. And I want to use those five minutes to head off something which is always said about people who end up in the position that I've ended up in. My position is, seek to vindicate the rationality of alien belief systems, even if you think the contents of those belief systems are false. Try to vindicate their rationality. Now, the objection that is commonly made to that uh, is that that is a, a, a form of cultural relativism. And in certain sections of the philosophical community, at least in Europe and the United States, relativism is sort of the worst thing you can be. That's really bad. So I want to ask, uh, am, I, am I a relativist? Well, yes, I am. Um, and obviously, I am, in a certain sense. I have relativized the notion of holding true a given belief because I've suggested that it may be rational for Cardinal Bellarmine to have held true the belief that the sun goes round the earth. Although, if any of you held that belief, I would be shocked. Okay, so that's a kind of relativism. And I think that as cultural historians, we must be relativists in that sense. 
But that is not the thesis of conceptual relativism. That, it's just a mistake to suppose that that is the thesis of conceptual relativism. There are conceptual relativists. Richard Rorty, in his great book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, is perfectly clearly a conceptual relativist. That's to say, he also discusses the famous argument between Galileo and Bellarmine, and what he says is that both positions were equally objective, and that if you prefer Galileo's position, that's because you believe in the rhetoric of science. So he thinks, he's a conceptual relativist, he thinks that what is true in our culture is different from what was true in Bellarmine's culture. So he wants to say that the, the view that the sun goes round the earth was true for Bellarmine, although it's not true for us. That is not what I'm arguing at all. Um, I assume that there's a fact of the matter. I assume that it's true that Bellarmine's belief is false. But that's not what I want to say. I don't want you to ask, was Bellarmine's view false? That's not interesting. The question is, how was it okay for him to hold it? Was it okay for him to hold it? Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. It thought that it wasn't because, of course, he refused to look through Galileo's telescope, which showed two moons of Jupiter, as we would say. But he knew that they didn't show two moons of Jupiter. It must be something on the lens, he thought. Well, why, why, why must it be the defective apparatus? Well, because he knew that Jupiter sat on a crystal sphere, which was impermeable. So there couldn't be moons, because they would have to go around it. But they would have to go through the crystal sphere, but they couldn't. So they can't, Jupiter can't have moons. So he patiently explained to Galileo, no, th this is not possible. So he had strong grounds for holding his belief to be true, but I'm asking, was it rational for him to hold that? And I'm saying yes, as far as I can see, it was. But notice we're not talking about truth here, so we're not talking about conceptual relativism. I'm not saying, as I think Rorty is, truth varies. I'm saying what it's rational to believe varies. Well, that is the end of what I want to say, except for one very important thing, which is that it would seem very natural, if I was listening to this lecture, to say to the lecturer, but, but um, you know, you've, you've spent nearly an hour talking to us. Don't, don't you want what you say to be true? Um, I told you my interpretation of that famous passage in Machiavelli and I tried to complicate the story very much from the usual story that's told. So, don't I want my story to be true? Well, that, no, I, that's not how I think we should talk. Obviously, historians are tracking the truth. And equally obviously, just to reassure you, I think there are many things which I believe, which are indisputably true. Uh, I mean, I believe that today is Monday. Actually, I've only just arrived from London, so maybe it's not. Is it, it is Monday, though. That today is Monday, and I'm in Taiwan. This is true. I, I don't doubt that for, for a moment. But what that shows us is that if we mean by true something more than what is rationally acceptable, then we mean that which is indubitable. That's unquestionably the case, that I'm in Taiwan on Monday. And that, that's, there's no question about that. Now, I agree with that, but that's not at all what the cultural disciplines are like. We may be trying to track the truth, but what we are trying to do as, as, as historians, as philosophers, we're trying to assemble evidence, we're trying to interpret testimony. Should I believe something on the authority of someone else? Why might that be a good thing to do? Is that possible? We often have to do that. How rational is that? How good is this evidence? Is there countervailing evidence? Could there be rival ho hypotheses? How would you choose? Now, if that's the world that we live in, and, and the humanist and the scientist both live in that world, in that they're both concerned with forming hypotheses and producing explanations, 
then what we should be talking about is do the facts fit together? Do they fit the best, does the hypothesis fit the best available evidence? Are the means to falsify hy the hypothesis? What is our preferred view of the subject matter? We, we're not talking about truth here at all. We're talking about what it's rational for us to believe. And that's what I think we should focus on. What I hope about my Machiavelli example is that you will think, yeah, I, that, that seems to fit the evidence best. That seems to tell us more than we thought. That, that there's no reason to doubt that. that. Yes. Of course, that might be overthrown. And it's the fate of all theories so far in the history of the world to have been overthrown. And that's something that we need to remember. But for the moment, that's looking good. But that's as much as I want you to feel about what I've said this afternoon. And it will be a great deal to me if you can say, well, that's, that's looking good. And I hope you do think that. And thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much for the wonderful lecture. I, I think if you want to take some question, I will ask Vice President Wang to, uh, uh, to chair the session. Yeah, there's two historians. Uh, <laughs> it's better to, uh, okay. So you say in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, President Wong, to give me this honor to chair this uh, discussion. So uh, anybody has any question to uh, ask Professor Quinnis? Yes, Kevin. Uh, thank you for a talk of profound eloquent thinking. It seems to me that you were just answering the question that I've said Thomas Kuhn for the whole, the whole, whole life that you brought up at lunch. That is that he wrote a book about scientific relativism, but throughout his career, he, wa he cared about the truth of this book. Um, and I agree with what, what, you, what you say, and, but I, I wonder how much difference is there between your position and historicism. And for the colleagues here who are not familiar with what uh, historicism is, historicism goes like this. Uh, we, un we try to understand what happened in the past, but people did things very differently. They thought in a way that, 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 that was very different from us, but they did it with a reason. And why we try to understand that reason, and this is this, this what historicism, historicism is largely about. But then people have criticized historicism. For example, they say that we defend what whatever people did in the past, even things like slavery or or, or Nazism, and and so so with your post Foucauldian or post Darwinian position, what's the difference between what you have just taught us and historicism, which had uh, which was, say, formulated by Monica before, before, before Foucault and Derrida. Yes. Thank you. Well, he, yeah. Is this on? Oh, yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you. These are very important points to raise. Um, the irony of it is that it is the position that I adopted uh, sorry, the position that I criticized, which is likely to run into the difficulties that you rightly identify in an historicist position of seeming to forgive everything that can be explained. In the case of someone le like La Durie, the sort of explanation that he wants to offer of the beliefs that he studies uh, is a very excusing form of explanation. It, um, first of all, classifies the beliefs as fantasies, and it then examines the causal pressures that generated, as he wants to say, those beliefs. So, the, But we all know that the more that I can give an account of the causal pressures on why you came to believe and perhaps as a result do something, the more readily it, it is possible to excuse you from doing it, because the more we talk about causes, the less we're talking about responsibility. So 
if there is a, a danger of the historian who professes to understand some horror in history of appearing to excuse it, it would be the sort of historian who wants to offer very strongly causal explanations. I don't want to be that kind of historian at all. There's nothing in my practice of intellectual history that would generate excusing mechanisms for historical horrors. What I would be doing, on the contrary, would be trying to say, what account could we give of what might have made it rational to hold the beliefs that generated some particular historical horror? And I think you might very well find, and of course this is something that's important to me, that you can't get a rationalist explanation out of this, and that you're driven to causal explanation. So uh, that, would, that, that would be the way I would want to go. So you're still looking worried. <laughs> I think you just visited uh, the, the museum or our institute this morning. And a lot of people were sacrificed because, because of the king. The king w was buried, and then all the people, all the people had to to guard him, and so they were sacrificed. And that was perfectly reasonable yes. at the time. Yes. And 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 to some extent, we we understand it. And uh, yes. But we are not today. We are not in a position to say that that is good or that good. is good. Yes. Yeah. Now I, I see the worry, um, but what I'm trying to say is that. The vindication of the internal rationality of a project of the kind you've just described that we would view with complete horror and we would be right to do so uh, doesn't commend that project to us. I mean, so that to, to, to explain it is not to excuse it. It's simply to show that there were sufficient conditions for it happening. And th there is, it is true, I see the worry. It, it is true that in the approach I'm talking about, th the, the aspiration to vindicate the internal rationality of the system may look an excusing mechanism. Is that your worry? Yes. You see, I think that, I, I see that. Uh, um, yes. Well, I, I suppose that w we do say we, we, see, we, see why they, we, we see why they did it. Yes, in the case you've given, we see why they did it, and that they could have given uh, a, a, an account of why it was appropriate to do that. Um, there's no reason for us to endorse that, though, is there? Uh, I, I mean, understanding is always good, but it's not the same as excusing. I, I mean, I can step back from the understanding that I've reached in an anthropological spirit and still ask... Um, if I were a moralist, I would ask, yeah, but what do I think about that? But that would be to do something else. It's not excluded that we can do that. Um, thanks for the lecture. It's very inspiring. Um, OK. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I think you are saying that um, when we are interpreted, interpreting a text, what we better do is to try to vindicate their rationality or their in, in, internal or somehow like uh, internal rationality. And you, you even give a more strong claim that we should make them as rational as possible. Yes. Right. I, I think this is too strong a claim. And why I believe so. Um, OK. Um, think about that if we are doing a history on, on the German Nazi history, right? And somehow we want to see that that's somehow rational. And we try to vindicate the, the rationality. And if it's one century in the future, then I think the future people will, 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 will can be more neutral than us, right? Because we will insert our own judgment into our study of German Nazi history, right? Yeah. But what I really want to question is, um, 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 sometimes um, the actor is not fully conscious of what he is doing, yeah. right? And yeah. somehow we can attribute an intention or a reason to the actor that better explain his action yeah. than he is capable of giving the account to himself, yeah. 
right? And I think that seems to be a a, a difficulty um, that you try to say that our focus is action, right? But you also say that we want to decentralize individual, we want to move to culture, to the whole context. But if we look into the whole cu culture and the context, if we look into the whole European culture in the 1930s, and when we try to explain the, the Nazis' actions, then I'm not sure if we want to explain their action, interpret their action in terms of their own um, internal rationality or in terms of the whole European culture at that time. Mm. Right. Okay. It seems to be somehow inconsistent between action and the, the culture, the context. Right, yeah. the different efforts. I see, yes. Well, let me make a distinction there because I think I haven't spoken clearly enough. When I was talking about the appropriateness of the language of action for interpretation, by contrast with the traditional stress on meaning, I was taking up a debate in postmodern culture about textual interpretation. We're not here talking about truth at all. My lecture was uh, addressed both issues, didn't it? Um, and Insofar as I was talking about um, the notion of textual interpretation, what I was trying to get away from was talk about meanings and towards talk about a vocabulary of action. That's to say, what intervention is made? What role is this playing in the culture? Everything that I tried to illustrate through the Machiavelli example. So there we're simply talking about textual interpretation. Now. A, a further question I raised in my lecture, which I, I can see why you worry about it, and, and this is something which uh, goes back to the first question, um, is about vindicating or seeking to vindicate the internal rationality of alien systems of belief. Now, I, I think we must start by trying to do this. This is the heuristic. What you should do is not ask, was the belief true, but was the belief a rational one to hold. Now, why should you do that? Because it's possible rationally to hold a false belief. So that's the philosophical claim that's central to it. Now, you may now, we're doing a heuristic here. All we've done so far is to say that's how we're going. I, I'm now investigating the rationality of a particular belief system. I may not find that it is rational according, that's to say, to the criteria uh, and the ideas of belief formation and its rationality in that society in that time. Now, that is, I would, I've, I've never studied this seriously, but, but surely that's what you're going to find if you look at a, a belief system as uh, insane, as a, a Nazi system of beliefs, I mean a, ra a set of racist beliefs, for example. Th those are not beliefs which it was rational to hold according to the best canons of belief formation and testing at the time. It just wasn't. So what happens now, we're still doing heuristics, is we say, okay, well, we can't give a rationalist explanation of this. So what, we, what you have to do then is to say, well, you know, something terrible has happened here, uh, and we're going to have to go in quest of the causes of that having been able to succeed. So you switch methodology at that point. My point is only don't switch methodology until you're sure that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that it, won't, that it will always come out. And that's perhaps what I should have said more firmly in answer to the first question. I'm saying, of course, there could be a point at which um, you think, well, God, th th this, system, uh, this system of beliefs is, is fantastic. How did this ever gain hold? Now, these are causal questions. Uh, w uh, and they will be deep questions in the case that you've talked about, ab about uh, social and economic conditions for society and, and how it can um, nurture various panics and fears and of, of the sort that La Durie and others talk about. My, I, I don't think that we, we don't want, I don't want to say we wish to exclude them. I'm saying don't start there. You might end up there, though. And in the case you've taken, we certainly would end up there. But you see, I think if you're taking the Nazi example for a moment, this is a very difficult topic, obviously, but that another thing that happens with historians who, um, who move to the causal story straight away is that you'd say, well, Hitler, well, he was obviously just mad. All right, that he, you know, there's nothing, he's just completely insane. Now, the truth is that's too easy. That lets the historian off the moral task. I mean, 
he may he may have been completely mad. No doubt he was. But somehow, uh, an entire highly civilized, well-educated country seemed to accept him as their leader. You've got to explain that. So unless you're willing to recognize that it's actually much more complicated than saying, oh, well, you, he's completely crazy, you'll never get good historical explanations. Don't start by saying that. You might in the end think, well, that's what we have to say in the end. So really, I'm doing heuristics. OK? Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. Professor Skinner, thank you for your most uh, profound and stimulating lecture. One of your major claim is that historians are always encouraged to treat taste as um, uh, doing some actions yeah. rather than a, a formation of belief. And I, I can't agree with you more uh, with that uh, statement, uh, particularly when you raised uh, our attention, draw our attention to Machiavelli test. But don't you think that uh, there we can, in one way or another, characterize different tests uh, with different degrees of intellectual intensity? Mm. Um, Machiavelli's test, uh, the prince, is highly intellectual um, with the great uh, contemporary purposes, as you just mentioned, uh, major against uh, uh, Cicero's uh, humanism and probably uh, Mico, uh, Pico de la Miradora's uh, Platonism as well. Um, but I'm not advocating for uh, La Tuhi because I don't speak French. Uh, <laughs> but his topic is about uh, peasants' uh, yeah. statements. St Peasant's taste. Yes. And so it is much less reflexive or intellectual as yes. Machiavelli's uh, yes. statement. And there are some, such as we, if a historian treat or want to discuss a sermon, for instance, a uh, sermon is, of course, there are s some sermon applied uh, by biblical words for contemporary issues. But very much the belief is simply a reification or recapitulation of uh, what they believe in, uh, in the Bible. Yeah. So uh, they are, or if we extend our research into oral tradition, for instance, mm. and this kind of test, so test is much, even much less uh, reflexive and intellectual. Mm. Uh, mm. So would you have uh, some suggestion for us? Uh, how can, if there is a, how can we deal with this kind of hermeneutic difficulty of mm -hmm. uh, treating different texts? Yes. And my second response of question is uh, your distinction between rationality and belief is a great advance from uh, Herbert Butterfield's uh, famous statement of the Huygens, or, oh, oh, discussion of Huygens interpretation. Mm. It just recall me, uh, uh, you, similarly, you try to, uh, you try to escape, on one hand, um, absolutist uh, position of interpretation of the past. Mm. On the other hand, not to fall into a complete uh, cynicism. Mm. Mm. It seems like uh, a great advance. Would you recall uh, for us, uh, if you uh, or review, uh, the differences between your position or your historiography and uh, Butterfield's? Mm. Or what? Mm. Well, thank, thank you, you for both the questions. Uh, on the second one, uh, that was a celebrated polemic, uh, um, the Whig interpretation of history, and um, it was directed against a tradition of historiography that I would also uh, want to direct my fire against. That's to say, um, the having of certain values in the present, the searching for those values in the past, and the writing of a history of the progress and triumph of those values. Um, you can always write history like that, uh, and of, of course, in, in the formation of, of um, professional history, 
uh, that was what um, we were trying to get away from. And that's really what he's talking about, is getting away from grand narratives which tell a story of triumph, uh, so that you, you never hear about the losers, you never hear about the sides that didn't win. Um, uh, you, you just hear the, 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 the triumphant story. And then if you uh, are living in a self-confident society, um, as he was writing about 19th century and early 20th century English historiography, this was a triumphant story of the emergence of freedom and democracy. Uh, and the, the value of the study of the past was held to be the revelation of that great story about ourselves. It's a frankly nationalistic uh, history that he was attacking. And if we're serious about um, the study of the past, we would certainly want it to be something other than a story of um, our own capacity to self-congratulate ourselves by looking uh, for our values in the past and explaining how they arose. Uh, we want a more rounded picture. So I would agree with his polemic. I don't have anything to add to it. It was classic and it, it, um, it stands. Um, on your first point about different kinds of texts, I, of course, agree with that. Um, I, I've just wanted to say that in, even in the most extended sense of the term texts, in which I've, which I've used this afternoon, I would want to say that there's a very fundamental distinction to be drawn uh, in thinking about texts, which is a distinction stemming from the philosophy of language, and it would be a distinction between meaning and speech acts. Um, any utterance that I issue um, hopefully has a meaning, but also performs an action. There's no case of an utterance that isn't also an action. That's what I want to say. And I would want to go further and say that language the natural languages that I know have this distinction in them between the, me the, the meanings of words and what you can do with the words um, and what acts you can perform with those words. I want to say that interpretation should focus on both. Traditionally, it is always focused on meaning, so I've tended to emphasize linguistic action instead of meaning. But both must always be there. Your point would be but they're going to be there in various um, quantities. And I agree with that. I mean, it seems to me that the question about speech acts or what is, what is going on in this text is going to be far more important in relation to um, obviously polemical writing, like, you know, uh, uh, an editorial in a newspaper or, or a, a political tract, uh, than it is about highly abstract writing or, shall we say, works of literature. Um, all I'm saying is don't exclude them from this dichotomous classification. There must be some actions being performed by the utterance, but you, you may not be very interested in those because of the sort of utterance it was. Um, and you may be working on a, a very abstract work of philosophy where you think, well, I just don't see that that's an interesting question to raise. And I, I might have to agree with you, but I would be surprised if I had to agree with you. Uh, I'm, I'm saying, however, that I'm in agreement with you that there are these two dimensions, and sometimes the dimension that I am emphasizing may not be very interesting to emphasize. It's just that it should never be forgotten. That's what I want to say. And it's always being forgotten. So, you know, even consider the recent historiography uh, of a, uh, as great a Western philosopher as Spinoza, Every single rule that I talked about this afternoon is broken in Jonathan Israel's work on Spinoza. He works out what it would be like to be a good, secularized, faintly radicalized American in the beginning of the 21st century, and he says, look, the great thing about Spinoza was that as long as you read him rather quickly and not very carefully, ah, he's saying exactly the same thing as I'm saying, and that's a wonderful thing for him to be doing. Well. It takes him a thousand pages to say that, but I mean that's that's as bad as it gets, as far as I'm concerned. That's Butterfield's worry, and that's my worry. I mean that, that's to say that's just triumphalist stories about ourselves. That's not history. And secondly, there's no attempt to articulate his project in relation to the society for which it was written. Why did he write this? We don't learn anything about that. Uh, Professor Skinner, I, I was trying to uh, 
uh, combine the two parts of your speech. Uh, I was wondering if it's possible. The mm. first part you talk about uh, uh, the view that uh, sees uh, the speech act yeah. uh, as a performing as political intervention. Yes. And in the second part, you talk about uh, you suggest that historian should try to um, uh, explain if it's uh, reasonable for the the author or the the, the holder of a belief to uh, uh, to say something or to hold right. his position. Um, if we um, read the text recording the debate between Cardinal Bellamy and uh, uh, Galileo. And is it possible that um, a historian also needs to find some reasons besides uh, rationality yeah. uh, behind Cardinal Bellamy's position? For example, there might be some uh, hidden purpose, hidden intention behind his uh, position. Yes. For for example, political stance. Yeah. Uh, yes. And we can determine if it's rational or it's it's truth because we have the scientific knowledge now. But for those other issues which we don't have scientific knowledge, uh, is it possible that uh, the historian? Uh, advice to do more investigation into the intentions rather than mm. rationality behind certain yeah, positions. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think that um, the, the two pieces of, uh, of my argument do fit together, but they leave something out which you're identifying, which is very interesting. I mean, if you take the, the, the famous debate, um, I was interested in its propositional content and I wanted to vindicate the rationality of the propositional content of Bellamine's position. That I think as f it, it, it might, f as far as I can see, have been rational for him to hold true that the belief that Galileo contested. Um, so there I'm just talking about the propositional content. Now, if we're talking about a, 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 an utterance, um, then of course, I'm not just interested in the propositional content, I'm interested in the speech acts. And um, a, single prop a single proposition might embody a multiplicity of speech acts. And I'm saying the task of the interpreter is to recover that intentionality. And you're absolutely right that there we cannot do without the notion of intentionality. You can do without it in relation to meaning, no doubt because meaning could overwrite intentions, but it, doesn't overwrite, it can't overwrite actions. And we're speaking about speech acts. Bellarmine must have been performing a lot of speech acts here. So uh, a w an historical account of that um, encounter would have to ask, well, w as well as what's being said, w what, are the, what, are the, what are the speech acts being performed? Okay, we could do that. I can't do that because I don't know that kind of history, but that could be done. But there's something else that you, you could do, which would be to say, well, you know, Bellamine is, I mean, among the speech acts he is performing, is he's, he's upholding a particular doctrine of the church, he's, he's repudiating a criticism, he, he's, he's also threatening, um, he, he, he's reaffirming, all sorts of speech acts are going on here. They're all at the level of intentionality. But the historian might want to say, but this is not what's really going on. And that's what interests you, isn't it? That, that, that we, we might want a story where we can give an explanation which satisfies us as being an explanation not available to the agents, but, but is the explanation that we should be giving. Now, I don't exclude that at all. Uh, that, that's not the, the sort of history I do, but of course I don't exclude that you could do that. And you, you might find... Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, of course, the obvious thing you might find is that what you want to say is that um, you might want to make a distinction between practical and epistemic rationality in the case of Bellarmine. You might want to say, well, I can see that it's practically rational for him to hold this belief because so much is at stake. But that would leave open the question of whether it's epistemically rational. 
and you might decide that it's not epistemically rational, although it is practically rational, because you think, my God, if we start going this way, then, you know, what happens to the Copernican system? So that's all connected up with, with social hierarchies, so what happens to them? Uh, and that might all be in his mind, and he might think, well, we just can't have that. Now, that would be rational in the sense that it would be practically rational, but it might also be a betrayal of rationality in that he might see that Galileo's argument was, was a better argument. Now, um, what has tended to happen in the recent historiography is that the distinction that you and I are drawing has been, has, has been erased. That people have wanted to say, well, don't ask, you know, which, which is the better theory. You, you have to ask about everything that the theory is doing. You might then decide, well, Bellamy's is the better theory. That was, of course, Rorty's position. I would be inclined, like you, to say that once we've distinguished epistemic from practical rationality, to show that something is just practically rational is to raise causal questions about why it isn't also epistemically rational. Okay? And you can, of course you can do that. Uh, and you, you should do that. But as I said, I'm doing heuristics. You, you shouldn't start doing that until you've satisfied yourself that this wasn't a genuine debate. Yeah. Do you know that he's a steward of Hawkeye? Oh, okay. Well, that's a good thing to be. <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Yes, please, Amy. Well, also, biologists, I apologize for my uh, ignorance about the uh, current development of history, but I'm a, a personally a history lover. So you're, uh, I appreciate very much of your distinction, distinction between uh, rationalist nationalization versus uh, truth, yeah. as exemplified by Bellinger and the Galileo debate. Uh, your emphasis on the uh, your position on this debate remind me of one of the uh, attitude adopted by one of the famous or uh, very reputable Chinese sci uh, Chinese history in last century, uh, what he called compassionate understanding. Uh, yeah. In that case, uh, he emphasized that the historian or any uh, people who concern about history of philosophy or anything should put yourself into the social contest and the cultural contest and analyze what happened and what caused that. Not exactly yeah. uh, as you said that the causal uh, the, the causal relationship of or causal rationalization of uh, some of this historical event. So uh, I really appreciate your talk. Well, thank you very much. I very much like your formula about compassionate understanding because uh, there's a great danger, I think, uh, in the cultural disciplines, in anthropology as well as in philosophy and in history, of a kind of condescension towards the subject matter. Now, in the very earliest questions that were raised in this discussion, there's the very interesting worry that's raised is, uh, you know, the, the, the French have this, um, this proverb, um, to understand everything is to excuse everything. To, to comprendre, c'est tout pardonner. If you really understand, then you, you pardon. And I can understand why one might feel well, we, we don't want to be as compassionate as that. But what you might want to say is that what would be uh, compassionate is the attempt to make the best sense we can of it, uh, after which we might find that we haven't, of course, pardoned it, but that we might claim that we've explained it. Yeah. So I completely agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Zheng zhi, Zheng zhi hong. Um, thank you. Um, I'm curious that um, have anyone applied uh, your idea about the proper text of a historian to the study of the, some uh, beliefs which we cherish to be ethical righteous today? 
for example, uh, democracy and uh, basic human rights. Suppose, uh, because we, they are rationally held to be ethically righteous, and also we think it's true, and we use such belief to judge those alien belief sy system of beliefs. So if we apply this your method to the study of our own cherished, very much cherished beliefs, mm. what will happen? Does that mean that uh, we simply hold some uh, beliefs which happen to be rationally uh, formed? And in that case, we have no right to make judgment on other beliefs which, is, which are alien to us. Yes. Well, I, I don't want to say that we don't have, have that obviously we have that right and we have that power, but I, I certainly think that it is no part of the historian, this is unfashionable, what I'm about to say, I do not think it's any part of the historian's task to be the judge of the materials studied. I think that the aspiration should neither be to praise nor to condemn, but to understand. And so th that's why I very much liked what was just said over here. That the notion of compassionate understanding, trying to do the best we can for these people, seeing how things were, is the task for the historian. Um, the task for the moralist is to come along and say what they think about it. Uh, but that's not, that's not an historian. Historians can be moralists if they want, but that's not the historian's task. The historian's task is to be a recording angel, not to be a judge. Now, whether that means that what we end up with is a kind of relativism about our values in which we would want to say, well, these are our values, but they were not their values. Well, th then I am a relativist in that way. Yes, I think that th there's every, I mean, I was distinguishing two kinds of relativism uh, I mean, conceptual relativism is a thesis about truth, but moral relativism is a completely different doctrine, which is simply the view that our values are our values, and we can make sense of them for our society, but they don't fit other societies. But that's, that's true. <laughs> we, you might wish to add that uh, in evolving such notions as, as human rights, we've done better than other societies. There's someone at the back as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, I myself is a cultural anthropologist, so I pretty much agree with whatever, uh, pretty much everything you said, including we're always trying to vindicate the seemingly irrational, unbelievable, r ridiculous beliefs and actions. But I think throughout your lecture and all the following up questions, I think there is still a very strong intentionalist, the intentionalist approach about human behaviors as if everything that humans do are motivated by intention. Like, do we always do things because this is the best we can do? Or do people do things because they feel like to do, because that's all, always what they do? I'm talking about embodiments or you know other kinds of uh, things that determine what we do and what we think and what we think is possible to argue about. So what my question is, what is the place of unreason, morality, ethics? Mm. This not specific, like, uh, what, what is the place of unreason or emotion or morality mm. in your methods of history? Like, I is the question that, is, it, is this rational, the question yeah. that we can apply to all cultures, all societies, and all histories? Well, thank you. Um, thank you first for what you say about the relation of this to anthropological theory, because obviously um, I'm much influenced by anthropological theories, which are the strongest instance of, of the problems that I'm trying to talk about this afternoon. The reason that the problems tend to escape uh, modern historians is that they are so much less acute than the kinds that anthropologists discover. I mean, if you interview someone who tells you, um, uh, as happened to Malinowski, that his grandfather was a penguin, then you're likely to think, wow, um, uh, you know, that, that's really difficult. I mean, you know, if that's what he believes. So, so what, what kind of a belief is that? So, yeah, the, the problems declare themselves very obviously. Now, uh, I, um, I need to make clear that underlying uh, 
the first part of my talk, which then I, I, I talked about in answering questions here, I was talking about an extremely specific feature of hermeneutics where intentionality is, I think, important. I think intentionality is of no importance in two very important aspects of the cultural project. One is that I completely accept the post-structuralist, um, uh, the deconstructionist move in relation to intentionality and meaning. It seems to me that the notion that you can um, explicate notions of, of meaning in relation to int intentionality is insensitive to the degree to which language, as Derrida excellently says, writes itself over intentionality because of the extent to which our utterances are, are ambiguous and uh, uh, the language can't be disambiguated. So I, I think that intentionality has very little to tell us in relation to meaning. Secondly, I think it has nothing at all to tell us in relation to the deep questions you raise about you know, whatever is actually moving masses of people to do things. We, we need to have um, very strong uh, psychological theories and probably very strong social deterministic theories uh, of a kind that are not very fashionable in historiography at the moment, but we need strong causal explanations there. We're not talking about intentionality at all. Um, we're, we're talking about very strong causal explanations. Um, our, our idea of what the relevant causal explanations are tend to be rather crude, and they tend to stem from large-scale, mostly 19th century social science. I mean, Weberian views, Marxist views, Durkheimian views in the West. These have all had great adherents, and, and t they tend to be much too monolithic about the character of the causes that they talk about. But the structure that you're asking me about there, I would completely agree with you about that. Where I want and this is unfashionable, intentionality to be absolutely central is in textual interpretation. Because whatever may have caused, um, whatever psych circumpressions, whatever emotional states, whatever, uh, the production of text, texts um, are utterances, and as well as having what we used to call meanings, uh, they embody speech acts. There's no utterance that you can issue that does not embody speech acts. But speech acts are feature of intentionality. And you can't, I think, get away from uh, the notion of intentionality there because um, we're talking about actions. And the, act, the, the acts that you perform are differentiated in virtue of the intentions that go into them. That's just what it is to perform an action, a voluntary action. Uh, and even a determinist would agree about that. If you deny that, you, you, you live in an extraordinary radical world in which, for example, there's no such thing as criminal responsibility because we would normally run that through the notion of an intention. So I want to preserve the notion of intention in relation to speech acts, and that's all. But for me, that's of supreme importance because I interpret texts, and all texts have a dimension of speech acts in them. And the historicist undertaking is the recovery of that intentionality. So it's a very small project, but it's my project. But the other two projects, I, I wouldn't want to say anything about intentionality in relation to them. Final question, I think. Yeah, this one. Uh, thanks for speech, and thanks for this chance. Uh, I think we need to think twice before we say about the history of political philosophy, because the three elements here are, uh, they have a uh, inner tension because I think first history is just about we seek the human nature in the span of time but philosophy itself is just seek for something that is metaphysical. So these two concepts uh, always contrast themselves and uh, another story here is politics. I think uh, you give a good name to your first, the book, famous book that the foundation of modern political thought. I think we can better say that political thought instead of political philosophy because politics and philosophy is two things that contrast themselves. So I think uh, this name we need to think before you give a speech here. Thank you. Yes. And uh, another question is, uh, I think uh, you, sa you say that uh, the. Historians need to uh, stand 
naturally, neutrally be, be, between all these values. Uh, I think the Max Weber speech, science as vocation. And I think that, uh, but in, in, in this abstract society, uh, ideology, or we can say that the scholars uh, themselves became a platonic legislator because their values can be a discourse that's going around in the society. So I think uh, histories, uh, historians like to stand against all the values, but they have to, or they must be a value burdener. So I think uh, how can we dissolve this paradox? I think in some sense the paradox uh, reflects the question Plato uh, proposed many years ago because the famous historian Homer was cast away by Plato and say, Plato said to Homer, oh, we do not welcome you in this politics. So I think, uh, can you give me a better understanding of these elements? Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you for both of those questions. Uh, I mean, I think I slightly um, dissent from th the strong distinction between politics and philosophy that you wanted to make in your first set of observations, because one of the consequences of stressing what you might call a, what was called a speech act appro approach to interpretation is to to question this distinction between um, works of I which which are obviously ideological uh, and works which are fundamentally philosophical i'm skeptical about that distinction because i think there will always be um, a, a contextual story to be told about even the most abstract works of philosophy. I haven't shown that this afternoon, but I've tried to show that in some of, in some of my work. On your second point about the, the, the relationship of the historian to, to his or her values, well, uh, I just want, want to make a hopeful distinction here. Of course, my values select the, the subject matter of my research. Uh, how could it be otherwise? I mean, would somebody somebody else's values? <laughs> uh, of, of course that is so. But the, the Weberian notion of the vocation is that although obviously the values select the subject matter, they must not select the treatment of the subject matter. And their Weberian notions of objectivity, of the kind that we're more familiar with in the sciences, apply equally in the humanities. Um, that our values, of course, um, affect every choice we make. But the question is whether they then contaminate the treatment of what you've decided to study. And we just must hope that they don't. I'll ask a simple question. Because I, read, I happen to read the person of Languadoc in my student days. But yes. I never finished. And recently I have the opportunity to reread uh, Latouille's New Territory of History. Oh, yes. I had a feeling that because when my, in my student day, Latouille's work is very famous. Mm. I remember in 1970, when he published the Carnival of Roman, yeah. appeared in Times yes. with uh, Gorbachev. Yes, yes. So he used to be very, very important. And he is still alive, I think. Yes, he is. Yeah, but recently I reread the new territory of his history. I got a feeling that. I'm not sh sure if he's r right or wrong. He's too scientific. Yes, yes. Including the the point you criticize uh, today. He's the, the all because of he's too scientific and he a, to a little bit too judgmental from yeah. outside of the the the, 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 the object he he he, he yes. treated. Yes. Uh, well, I, I completely agree with all of this. The reason I. I uh, took him as an example I is that um, he was not a straw man. I mean, he, he was for a time the most famous historian in the Western world, uh, and so uh, it, it's worth it's worth engaging uh, w with his work. But if you go back to it, um, it it it, um, it it's it's uh, yes, um, uh, it's not so good <laughs> because I, I think the methodology was always Marxist. So the story is always a causal story. So everything that I've tried to talk about this afternoon, he would want to sweep out of the way. He would say, no, well, what's, what's really going on here? And it's always going to have some um, uh, very strong causal and economic story, which, which is going to be the motor for everything. 
Uh, and so the idea of, of trying to work out the, the, the mental world of, of, of a world very different from ours, he would view uh, in, in the early work with, with great impatience. Um, and uh, so insofar as what he's looking for is causal explanations, then yes, he's a very scientific historian, very much so. And that was the, the great image of scientific history that the Annals School tried to popularize. But people of my generation, of course, we, we tried to take that all to pieces. We thought that too much was being missed out. And now we shall all be taken to pieces. <laughs> I think time is up. And I know many of you uh, know Quentin Skinner from the uh, 1970s. I always remember that uh, in 1970s, I purchased a pirate edition of The Return of Grand Theory. <laughs> that was edited by uh, Qu Professor Quentin Skinner. And today we have uh, this uh, opportunity to discuss uh, all these questions with him. Uh, I'd like to thank him again. Thank you. Thank you.